Chapter Four of Specimen Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Specimen Days by Walt Whitman. Chapter Four. Battle of Gettysburg, July Fourth. The weather today, upon the whole, is very fine, warm, but from a smart rain last night, fresh enough, and no dust, which is a great relief for this city. I saw the parade about noon, Pennsylvania Avenue, from 15th Street down toward the Capitol. There were three regiments of infantry, I suppose the ones doing patrol duty here, two or three societies of odd fellows, a lot of children in barouches, and a squad of policemen. A useless imposition upon the soldiers. They have work enough on their backs without piling the like of this. As I went down the avenue I saw a big, flaring placard on the bulletin board of a newspaper office announcing, "'Glorious victory for the Union Army!' Meade had fought Lee at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, yesterday and day before, and repulsed him most signally, taken three thousand prisoners, etc. I afterwards saw Meade's despatch, very modest, and a sort of order of the day from the President himself, quite religious, giving thanks to the Supreme, and calling on the people to do the same. I walked on to the Armory Hospital, took along with me several bottles of blackberry and cherry syrup, good and strong but innocent, went through several of the wards, announced to the soldiers the news from Meade, and gave them all a drink of the syrup with ice-water, quite refreshing, prepared it all myself, and served it around. Meanwhile the Washington bells are ringing their sundown pills for Fourth of July, and the usual fusillades of boys' pistols, crackers, and guns. A CAVALRY CAMP I am writing this, nearly sundown, watching a cavalry company, acting signal service, just come in through a shower, making their night's camp ready on some broad, vacant ground, a sort of hill in full view opposite my window. There are the men in their yellow striped jackets. All are dismounted. The freed horses stand with drooping heads and wet sides. They are to be led off presently in groups to water. The little wall tents and shelter tents spring up quickly. I see the fires already blazing, and pots and kettles over them. Some among the men are driving in tent poles, wielding their axes with strong, slow blows. I see great huddles of horses, bundles of hay, groups of men, some with unbuckled sabres yet on their sides, a few officers, piles of wood, the flames of the fires, saddles, harness, etc. The smoke streams upward, additional men arrive and dismount, some drive in stakes and tie their horses to them, some go with buckets for water, some are chopping wood, and so on. July 6th. A steady rain, dark and thick and warm. A train of six mule wagons has just passed bearing pontoons, great square-end flatboats, and the heavy planking for overlaying them. We hear that the Potomac above here is flooded, and are wondering whether Lee will be able to get back across again, or whether Meade will indeed break him to pieces. The cavalry camp on the hill is a ceaseless field of observation for me. This forenoon there stand the horses, tethered together, dripping, steaming, chewing their hay. The men emerge from their tents, dripping also. The fires are half quenched. July 10th. Still the camp opposite, perhaps fifty or sixty tents. Some of the men are cleaning their sabres, pleasant to-day, some brushing boots, some laying off, reading, writing, some cooking, some sleeping. On long temporary cross-sticks back of the tents are cavalry accoutrements. Blankets and overcoats are hung out to air. There are the squads of horses tethered, feeding, continually stamping and whisking their tails to keep off flies. I sit long in my third-story window and look at the scene. A hundred little things going on, peculiar objects connected with the camp that could not be described, any one of them justly, without much minute drawing and coloring in words. A New York Soldier this afternoon, July 22nd, I have spent a long time with Oscar F. Wilbur, Company G, 154th New York, low with chronic diarrhea and a bad wound also. He asked me to read him a chapter in the New Testament. I complied and asked him what I should read. He said, Make your own choice. I opened at the close of one of the first books of the Evangelists, and read the chapters describing the latter hours of Christ, and the scenes at the crucifixion. The poor, wasted young man asked me to read the following chapter also, How Christ Rose Again. I read very slowly, for Oscar was feeble. It pleased him very much, yet the tears were in his eyes. 
He asked me if I enjoyed religion. I said, Perhaps not, my dear, in the way you mean, and yet, maybe, it is the same thing. He said, It is my chief reliance. He talked of death, and said he did not fear it. I said, Why, Oscar, don't you think you will get well? He said, I may, but it is not probable. He spoke calmly of his condition. The wound was very bad. It discharged much. Then the diarrhea had prostrated him, and I felt that he was even then the same as dying. He behaved very manly and affectionate. The kiss I gave him as I was about leaving, he returned fourfold. He gave me his mother's address, Mrs. Sally D. Wilbur, Allegheny Post Office, Cattaraugus County, New York. I had several such interviews with him. He died a few days after the one just described. Homemade Music August 8th Tonight, as I was trying to keep cool, sitting by a wounded soldier in Armory Square, I was attracted by some pleasant singing in an adjoining ward. As my soldier was asleep, I left him, and entering the ward where the music was, I walked halfway down and took a seat by the cot of a young Brooklyn friend, S. R., badly wounded in the hand at Chancellorsville, and who has suffered much, but at that moment in the evening was wide awake and comparatively easy. He had turned over on his left side to get a better view of the singers, but the mosquito curtains of the adjoining cots obstructed the sight. I stepped round and looped them all up, so that he had a clear show, and then sat down again by him, and looked and listened. The principal singer was a young lady nurse of one of the wards, accompanying on a melodeon, and joined by the lady nurses of other wards. They sat there, making a charming group, with their handsome healthy faces, and standing up a little behind them were some ten or fifteen of the convalescent soldiers, young men, nurses, etc., with books in their hands, singing. Of course it was not such a performance as the great soloists at the New York Opera House take a hand in, yet I am not sure but I received as much pleasure under the circumstances, sitting there, as I have had from the best Italian compositions, expressed by world-famous performers. The men lying up and down the hospital, in their cots, some badly wounded, some never to rise thence, the cots themselves with their drapery of white curtains, and the shadows down the lower and upper parts of the ward, then the silence of the men, and the attitudes they took. The whole was a sight to look around upon again and again. And there sweetly rose the voices up to the high, whitewashed wooden roof, and pleasantly the roof sent it all back again. They sang very well, mostly quaint old songs and declamatory hymns, to fitting tunes. Here, for instance, My days are swiftly gliding by, and I, a pilgrim stranger, would not detain them as they fly, those hours of toil and danger. For, oh, we stand on Jordan's strand, our friends are passing over, and just before the shining shore we may almost discover. We'll gird our loins, my brethren dear, our distant home discerning. Our absent Lord has left us word, let every lamp be burning. For, oh, we stand on Jordan's strand, our friends are passing over, and just before the signing shore we may almost discover. Abraham Lincoln August 12th. I see the President almost every day, as I happen to live where he passes to or from his lodgings out of town. He never sleeps at the White House during the hot season, but has quarters at a healthy location some three miles north of the city, the Soldiers' Home, a United States military establishment. I saw him this morning about 8.30 coming into business, riding on Vermont Avenue, near L Street. He always has a company of twenty-five or thirty cavalry, with sabres drawn and held upright over their shoulders. They say this guard was against his personal wish, but he let his counsellors have their way. The party makes no great show in uniform or horses. Mr. Lincoln, on the saddle, generally rides a good-sized, easy-going gray horse, is dressed in plain black, somewhat rusty and dusty, wears a stiff black hat, and looks about as ordinary in attire, etc., as the commonest man. A lieutenant with yellow straps rides at his left, and following behind, two by two, come the cavalrymen, in their yellow striped jackets. They are generally going at a slow trot, as that is the pace set them by the one they wait upon. The sabres and accoutrements clank, and the entirely unornamental cortege, as it trots towards Lafayette Square, arouses no sensation, only some curious stranger stops and gazes. I see very plainly Abraham Lincoln's dark brown face, with the deep-cut lines, the eyes always to me with a deep, latent sadness in the expression. We have got so that we exchange bows, and very cordial ones. Sometimes the President goes and comes in an open barouche. 
the cavalry always accompany him, with drawn sabres. Often I notice as he goes out evenings, and sometimes in the morning, when he returns early, he turns off and halts at the large and handsome residence of the Secretary of War, on K Street, and holds conference there. If in his barouche I can see from my window he does not alight, but sits in his vehicle, and Mr. Stanton comes out to attend him. Sometimes one of his sons, a boy of ten or twelve, accompanies him, riding at his right on a pony. Earlier in the summer I occasionally saw the President and his wife, toward the latter part of the afternoon, out in a barouche, on a pleasure ride through the city. Mrs. Lincoln was dressed in complete black, with a long crape veil. The equipage is of the plainest kind, only two horses, and they nothing extra. They passed me once very close, and I saw the President in the face fully, as they were moving slowly, and his look, though abstracted, happened to be directed steadily in my eye. He bowed and smiled, but far beneath his smile I noticed well in the expression I have alluded to. None of the artists or pictures has caught the deep, though subtle and indirect expression of this man's face. There is something else there. One of the great portrait painters of two or three centuries ago is needed. Heated Term There has lately been much suffering here from heat. We have had it upon us now eleven days. I go around with an umbrella and a fan. I saw two cases of sunstroke yesterday, one in Pennsylvania Avenue and another in Seventh Street. The city railroad company loses some horses every day. Yet Washington is having a livelier August, and is probably putting in a more energetic and satisfactory summer than ever before during its existence. There is probably more human electricity, more population to make it, more business, more light-heartedness than ever before. The armies that swiftly circumambiated from Fredericksburg, marched, struggled, fought, had out their mighty clinch and hurl at Gettysburg, wheeled, circumambiated again, returned to their ways, touching us not, either at their going or coming. And Washington feels that she has passed the worst, perhaps feels that she is henceforth mistress. So here she sits with her surrounding hills spotted with guns, and is conscious of a character and identity different from what it was five or six short weeks ago, and very considerably pleasanter and prouder. SOLDIERS AND TALKS Soldiers, 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 you meet everywhere about the city, often superb-looking men, though invalids dressed in worn uniforms, and carrying canes or crutches. I have often talks with them, occasionally quite long and interesting. One, for instance, will have been all through the peninsula under McClellan, narrates to me the fights, the marches, the strange, quick changes of that eventful campaign, and gives glimpses of many things untold in any official reports or books or journals. These, indeed, are the things that are genuine and precious. The man was there, has been out two years, has been through a dozen fights. The superfluous flesh of talking is long worked off him, and he gives me little but the hard meat and sinew. I find it refreshing, these hardy, bright, intuitive, American young men, experienced soldiers with all their youth. The vocal play and significance moves one more than books. Then there hangs something majestic about a man who has borne his part in battles, especially if he is very quiet regarding it when you desire him to unbosom. I am continually lost at the absence of blowing and blowers among these old young American militaires. I have found some man or other who has been in every battle since the war began, and have talked with them about each one in every part of the United States, and many of the engagements on the rivers and harbors, too. I find men here from every state in the Union without exception. There are more Southerners, especially border state men, in the Union Army than is generally supposed. I now doubt whether one can get a fair idea of what this war practically is, or what genuine America is, and her character, without some such experience as this I am having. DEATH OF A WISCONSIN OFFICER Another characteristic scene of that dark and bloody 1863, from notes of my visit to Armory Square Hospital, one hot but pleasant summer day. In Ward H we approach the cot of a young lieutenant of one of the Wisconsin regiments. Tread the bare floorboard lightly here, for the pain and panting of death are in this cot. I saw the lieutenant when he was first brought here from Chancellorsville, and have been with him occasionally from day to day and night to night. He had been getting along pretty well till night before last, when a sudden hemorrhage that could not be stopped came upon him, and to-day it still continues at intervals. Notice that water-pail by the side of the bed. 
with a quantity of blood, and bloody pieces of muslin nearly full, that tells the story. The poor young man is struggling painfully for breath, his great dark eyes with a glaze already upon them, and the choking, faint, but audible in his throat. An attendant sits by him, and will not leave him till the last, yet little or nothing can be done. He will die here in an hour or two, without the presence of kith or kin. Meantime the ordinary chat and business of the ward a little way off goes on indifferently. Some of the inmates are laughing and joking, others are playing checkers or cards, others are reading, etc. I have noticed, through most of the hospitals, that as long as there is any chance for a man, no matter how bad he may be, the surgeon and nurses work hard, sometimes with curious tenacity, for his life, doing everything and keeping somebody by him to execute the doctor's orders, and minister to him every minute day and night. See that screen there. As you advance through the dusk of early candlelight, a nurse will step forth on tiptoe, and silently but imperiously forbid you to make any noise, or perhaps to come near at all. Some soldier's life is flickering there, suspended between recovery and death. Perhaps at this moment the exhausted frame has just fallen into a light sleep that a step might shake. You must retire. The neighboring patients must move in their stocking feet. I have been several times struck with such marked efforts, everything bent to save a life from the very grip of the destroyer. But when that grip is once firmly fixed, leaving no hope or chance at all, the surgeon abandons the patient. If it is a case where stimulus is any relief, the nurse gives milk punch or brandy, or whatever is wanted, ad libitum. There is no fuss made. Not a bit of sentimentalism or whining have I seen about a single deathbed in a hospital or on the field, but generally impassive indifference. All is over, as far as any efforts can avail. It is useless to expend emotions or labors. While there is a prospect, they strive hard, at least most surgeons do, but death certain and evident, they yield the field. Note. Mr. Garfield, in the House of Representatives, April 15th, 79. Do gentlemen know that, leaving out all the border states, there were fifty regiments and seven companies of white men in our army fighting for the Union from the states that went into rebellion? Do they know that from the single state of Kentucky more Union soldiers fought under our flag than Napoleon took into the Battle of Waterloo? More than Wellington took with all the Allied armies against Napoleon? Do they remember that 186,000 colored men fought under our flag against the rebellion and for the Union, and that of that number 90,000 were from the states which went into rebellion? Hospitals Ensemble August, September, and October, 63 I am in the habit of going to all, and to Fairfax Seminary, Alexandria, and over Longbridge that great convalescent camp. The journals publish a regular directory of them, a long list. As a specimen of almost any one of the larger of these hospitals, you fancy to yourself a space of three to twenty acres of ground, on which are grouped ten or twelve very large wooden barracks, with perhaps a dozen or twenty, and sometimes more than that number, small buildings, capable altogether of accommodating from five hundred to a thousand or fifteen hundred persons. Sometimes these wooden barracks or wards, each of them perhaps from a hundred to a hundred and fifty feet long, ranged in a straight row, evenly fronting the street, others are planned so as to form an immense V, and others again are ranged around a hollow square. They make altogether a huge cluster, with the additional tents, extra wards for contagious diseases, guard-houses, sutler's stores, chaplain's house, in the middle will probably be an edifice devoted to the offices of the surgeon in charge and the ward surgeons, principal attachés, clerks, etc. The wards are either lettered alphabetically, Ward G, Ward K, or else numerically, 1, 2, 3, etc. Each has its ward surgeon and corps of nurses. Of course there is, in the aggregate, quite a muster of employees, and over all the surgeon in charge. Here in Washington, when these army hospitals are all filled, as they have been already several times, they contain a population more numerous in itself than the whole of Washington of ten or fifteen years ago. Within sight of the capital, as I write, there are some thirty or forty such collections, at times holding from fifty to seventy thousand men. Looking from any eminence and studying the topography in my rambles, I use them as landmarks. Through the rich august verdure of the trees, I see that white group of buildings off yonder in the outskirts, then another cluster half a mile to the left of the first, 
then another a mile to the right, and another a mile beyond, and still another between us and the first. Indeed, we can hardly look in any direction, but these clusters are dotting the landscape and environs. That little town, as you might suppose it, off there, on the brow of the hill, is indeed a town, but of wounds, sickness, and death. It is Finley Hospital, northeast of the city on Kendall Green, as it used to be called. That other is Campbell Hospital. Both are large establishments. I have known these two alone to have from two thousand to twenty-five hundred inmates. Then there is Carver Hospital, larger still, a walled and military city regularly laid out, and guarded by squads of sentries. Again, off east, Lincoln Hospital, a still larger one, and half a mile further, Emory Hospital. Still sweeping the eye around the river towards Alexandria, we see to the right the locality where the convalescent camp stands, with its five, eight, or sometimes ten thousand inmates. Even all these are but a portion. The Harewood, Mount Pleasant, Armory Square, Judiciary Hospitals, are some of the rest, and all large collections. A SILENT NIGHT RAMBLE October 20th Tonight, after leaving the hospital at ten o'clock, I had been on self-imposed duty some five hours, pretty closely confined, I wandered a long time around Washington. The night was sweet, very clear, sufficiently cool, a voluptuous half-moon, slightly golden, the space near it of a transparent blue-gray tinge. I walked up Pennsylvania Avenue, and then to Seventh Street, and a long while around the patent office. Somehow it looked rebukingly strong, majestic, there in the delicate moonlight. The sky, the planets, the constellations all so bright, so calm, so expressively silent, so soothing after these hospital scenes. I wandered to and fro, till the moist moon set, long after midnight. SPIRITUAL CHARACTERS AMONG THE SOLDIERS Every now and then, in hospital or camp, there are beings I meet, specimens of unworldliness, disinterestedness, and animal purity and heroism. Perhaps some unconscious Indianan, or from Ohio or Tennessee, on whose birth the calmness of heaven seems to have descended, and whose gradual growing up, whatever the circumstances of work-life or change, or hardship, or small or no education that attended it, the power of a strange spiritual sweetness, fibre and inward health, have also attended. Something veiled and abstracted is often a part of the manners of these beings. I have met them, I say, not seldom in the army, in camp, and in the hospitals. The western regiments contain many of them. They are often young men, obeying the events and occasions about them, marching, soldiering, riding, foraging, cooking, working on farms or at some trade before the war, unaware of their own nature, as to that who is aware of his own nature, their companions only understanding that they are different from the rest, more silent, something odd about them, and apt to go off and meditate and muse in solitude. Cattle Droves About Washington Among other sights are immense droves of cattle with their drivers, passing through the streets of the city. Some of the men have a way of leading the cattle by a peculiar call, a wild, pensive hoot, quite musical, prolonged, indescribable, sounding something between the cooing of a pigeon and the hoot of an owl. I like to stand and look at the sight of one of these immense droves, a little way off, as the dust is great. There are always men on horseback, cracking their whips and shouting, the cattle low, some obstinate ox or steer attempts to escape, then a lively scene, the mounted men, always excellent riders and on good horses, dash after the recusant, and wheel and turn, a dozen mounted drovers, their great, slouched, broad-brimmed hats, very picturesque, another dozen on foot, everybody covered with dust, long goads in their hands, an immense drove of perhaps one thousand cattle, the shouting, hooting, movement, etc. Hospital Perplexity To add to other troubles, amid the confusion of this great army of the sick, it is almost impossible for a stranger to find any friend or relative unless he has the patient's specific address to start upon. Besides the directory printed in the newspapers here, there are one or two general directories of the hospitals kept at Provost's headquarters, but they are nothing like complete. They are never up to date, and, as things are, with the daily streams of coming and going and changing, cannot be. I have known cases, for instance, such as a farmer coming here from northern New York to find a wounded brother, faithfully hunting around for a week, and then compelled to leave and go home without getting any trace of him. 
When he got home, he found a letter from the brother giving the right address. Down at the Front Culpeper, Virginia, February, 1864 Here I am front pretty well down toward the extreme front. Three or four days ago General S., who is now in chief command, I believe Meade is absent or sick, moved a strong force southward from camp as if intending business. They went to the Rapidan. There has since been some maneuvering and a little fighting, but nothing of consequence. The telegraphic accounts given Monday morning last make entirely too much of it, I should say. What General S. intended, we here know not, but we trust in that competent commander. We were somewhat excited, but not so very much either, on Sunday, during the day and night, as orders were sent out to pack up and harness, and be ready to evacuate, to fall backwards towards Washington. But I was very sleepy, and went to bed. Some tremendous shouts arousing me during the night, I went forth and found it was from the men above mentioned, who were returning. I talked with some of the men. As usual, I found them full of gaiety, endurance, and many fine little outshows, the signs of the most excellent good manliness of the world. It was a curious sight to see those shadowy columns moving through the night. I stood unobserved in the darkness and watched them long. The mud was very deep. The men had their usual burdens, overcoats, knapsacks, guns, and blankets. Along and along they filed by me, with often a laugh, a song, a cheerful word, but never once a murmur. It may have been odd, but I never before so realized the majesty and reality of the American people en masse. It fell upon me like a great awe. The strong ranks moved neither fast nor slow. They had marched seven or eight miles already through the slipping, unctuous mud. The brave First Corps stopped here. The equally brave Third Corps moved on to Brandy Station. The famous Brooklyn Fourteenth are here, guarding the town. You see their red legs actively moving everywhere. Then they have a theatre of their own here. They give musical performances, nearly everything done capitally. Of course the audience is a jam. It is good sport to attend one of these entertainments of the Fourteenth. I like to look around at the soldiers and the general collection in front of the curtain more than the scene on the stage. Paying the Bounties One of the things to note here now is the arrival of the paymaster with his strong box, and the payment of bounties to veterans re-enlisting. Major H. is here to-day, with a small mountain of greenbacks, rejoicing the hearts of the second division of the First Corps. In the midst of a rickety shanty, behind a little table, sit the Major and Clerk Eldridge, with the rolls before them, and much money. A re-enlisted man gets in cash about two hundred down, and heavy installments following, as the paydays arrive, one after another. The show of the men crowding around is quite exhilarating. I like to stand and look. They feel elated, their pockets full, and the ensuing furlough, the visit home. It is a scene of sparkling eyes and flushed cheeks. The soldier has many gloomy and harsh experiences, and this makes up for some of them. Major H. is ordered to pay first all the re-enlisted men of the First Corps their bounties and back pay, and then the rest. You hear the peculiar sound of the rustling of the new and crisp greenbacks by the hour, through the nimble fingers of the Major and my friend Clerk E. Rumors, changes, etc. About the excitement of Sunday, and the orders to be ready to start, I have heard since that the said orders came from some cautious minor commander, and that the high principalities knew not and thought not of any such move, which is likely. The rumour and fear here intimated a long circuit by Lee, and flank attack on our right. But I cast my eyes at the mud, which was then at its deepest and palmiest condition, and retired composedly to rest. Still it is about time for Culpepper to have a change. Authorities have chased each other here like clouds in a stormy sky. Before the first bull run this was the rendezvous and camp of instruction of the secession troops. I am stopping at the house of a lady who has witnessed all the eventful changes of the war, along this route of contending armies. She is a widow, with a family of young children, and lives here with her sister in a large, handsome house. A number of army officers board with them. Virginia Dilapidated, fenceless, and trodden with war, as Virginia is, Wherever I move across her surface, I find myself roused to surprise and admiration. What capacity for products, improvements, human life, nourishment, and expansion! Everywhere that I have been in the old dominion, the subtle mockery of that title now, such thoughts have filled me. The soil is yet far above the average of any of the northern states. And how full of breadth the scenery, 
everywhere distant mountains, everywhere convenient rivers. Even yet prodigal in forest woods, and surely eligible for all the fruits, orchards, and flowers. The skies and atmosphere, most luscious, as I feel certain, for more than a year's residence in the state, and movements hither and yon. I should say very healthy as a general thing. Then a rich and elastic quality, by night and by day. The sun rejoices in his strength, dazzling and burning, and yet to me never unpleasantly weakening. It is not the panting tropical heat, but invigorates. The north tempers it. The nights are often unsurpassable. Last evening, February 8th, I saw the first of the new moon, the outlined old moon clear along with it, the sky and air so clear, such transparent hues of color, it seemed to me, I had never really seen the new moon before. It was the thinnest cut crescent possible. It hung delicate, just above the sulky shadow of the blue mountains. Ah, if it might prove an omen and good prophecy for this unhappy state. Summer of 1864 I am back again in Washington, on my regular duty in nightly rounds. Of course there are many specialties. Dotting a ward here and there are always cases of poor fellows, long-suffering under obstinate wounds, or weak and disheartened from typhoid fever or the like, marked cases needing special and sympathetic nourishment. These I sit down and either talk to, or silently cheer them up. They always like it hugely, and so do I. Each case has its peculiarities, and needs some new adaptation. I have learnt to thus conform, learnt a good deal of hospital wisdom. Some of the poor young chaps, away from home for the first time in their lives, hunger and thirst for affection. This is sometimes the only thing that will reach their condition. The men like to have a pencil and something to write in. I have given them cheap pocket diaries, and almanacs for 1864, underleaved with blank paper. For reading I generally have some old pictorial magazines or story papers. They are always acceptable. Also, the morning or evening papers of the day. The best books I do not give, but lend to read through the wards, and then take them to others, and so on. They are very punctual about returning the books. In these wards, or on the field, as I thus continue to go round, I have come to adapt myself to each emergency, after its kind or call, however trivial, however solemn, every one justified and made real under its circumstances, not only visits and cheering talk and little gifts, not only washing and dressing wounds, I have met some cases where the patient is unwilling any one should do this but me, but passages from the Bible, expounding them, prayer at the bedside, explanations of doctrine, etc. I think I see my friends smiling at this confession, but I was never more earnest in my life. In camp and everywhere, I was in the habit of reading or giving recitations to the men. They were very fond of it, and liked declamatory poetical pieces. We would gather in a large group by ourselves, after supper, and spend the time in such readings, or in talking, and occasionally by an amusing game called the Game of Twenty Questions. End of chapter 4